Hello and welcome back to Doorstep Discoveries. As lockdown continues, we are all striving to keep positive and keep motivated. So I hope that everybody is safe and sane. We have had some very exciting developments with Billy and his badgers over the last week. So before we dive into today's main stories, we're gonna quickly cut to Billy to hear what's been going on. So in last week's episode, I said that if we're really lucky that the badgers and the foxes may well have already given birth to this year's young. Well, in fact, I already knew that my badger family had increased by at least one new member, but I wasn't gonna show you the footage until next week's episode. That was until I checked my other camera trap a couple of nights ago and found that I had recorded this, a mother badger with not one, but two badger cubs. And since then, I've been itching to get back and go and check my other camera trap, which I'm now only checking once a week. And I'm so unbelievably happy and excited to reveal that after checking it this morning, we have not two, not even three or four, but we have five brand new bouncing baby badger cubs living right behind my garden. And just to be a total tease and to keep you wanting more, that's all you're getting from me this time. So you're gonna have to wait until next week's episode for a full update from my newly expanded badger family. Five badger cubs, how amazing. We will hear more from Billy and the new additions to the set in next week's episode. So for now, we're gonna to head to Somerset where wildlife cameraman Robbie Labanowski has been turning his lens on his local residents. Hi, I'm Robbie, and today I'm in Somerset, where I'm probably going to be for quite some time, it would seem. And I'm going to be checking in on our wild beehive. Now, this hive we put up at the beginning of the last year in the hope that it would attract some wild honeybees. And sure enough, a swarm of bees actually arrived. Now, during the winter, they've spent most of their time huddled together in a big ball, a little bit like penguins. They've been rotating, taking it in turns to be on the outside so they don't get too cold. And that's the way they managed to get through the winter without ever actually hibernating. But now that the days are warming up and getting longer, the bees are becoming much more active. And the reason for that is because somewhere inside that hive is the queen bee. Now she's the only one that lays eggs in the colony. She can actually lay up to around 1500 eggs a day, which is amazing. But you can imagine all those grubs are gonna need a lot of food. So the worker bees that you can see buzzing around behind me are really having to up their food collection game. Now worker bees can travel for several miles away from the hive to find food, but to make life a little bit easier for these bees, we've put the hive in an area where there are a lot of wild cherry trees, which you can see are already in full blossom. So these bees luckily don't have to go very far at the moment to find food, there's plenty for them here. Now if you're lucky enough to have a garden that has flowers blooming in it at the moment, you may well see some honeybees if you look carefully, and they'll be busily collecting nectar and pollen from those flowers. And the way they do that, if you look at them really carefully, you'll see the bees put their heads right inside the flower to suck up the nectar. And at the same time as they're doing that, they'll be scraping the stamens of the flower with their back legs, trying to collect as much pollen as they can in their pollen sacs. Now I can tell these bees have been visiting several different species of flower, and that's because the pollen that they're bringing back to the hive is a range of different colors. Different flowers have different colored pollen. This hive is just for the bees. It's not for us to collect honey from. We just let the bees do their thing. But there is a hatch on the bottom of the hive that you can remove every now and again, just to have a look inside and see how they're doing. And in September last year, we took that hatch off, just to have a little peek. And the bees had made seven honeycombs all lined up on the top of the hive. Now, hopefully in my next video, I'm gonna be able to take that hatch off again and we'll have a look inside the hive and see how they're getting on. But for now, I'm gonna say goodbye to the bees and probably go and have a self-isolation beer. So I'll see you next time. Now, not all of us have the space or the resources for a hive like Robbie's, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something that we can all do to make our gardens or outdoor spaces more wildlife friendly. And next, we've got Sophie Bavell, who's gonna be giving us a guiding hand in what we can do to attract wildlife to our doorsteps. Now, yes, it's been a very bizarre and worrying time, but there is no doubt that there's been this extraordinary surge in a desire to be outside, connect with nature, and make the most of the random things that we have lying around the house and garden. So, with that in mind, we're gonna make a pond, but a pond in a pot. We are going to upcycle this old pot into a wildlife haven. 
If space is an issue for you, not a problem. You can use something like an old washing up bowl or even just an old flower pot does an amazing job at holding water and attracting wildlife. Often lots of flower pots obviously have holes for drainage at the bottom, so we want to make it watertight. And of course, we want to create lots of lovely layers to create habitat in our pond. So I've got together a selection of pebbles and gravel. I've also got a bit of old pot that I found under the bin, and um, that's gonna be a little ramp because obviously we want wildlife to get in, but wildlife might want to get out. The nice thing about plants is that they oxygenate the water, so they make it really clear, really healthy, attract lots of insects. So next, we are ready to uh, get ponding. So this bit is all about creating layers of habitat, little nooks and crannies for the little creatures that I really hope will settle. My all important ramp is gonna go, I think, maybe like that. We want the plants to be up high so that they can be out like so. Okay team, we have a up close and personal view of my recently created pond. We have our pond, but it's lacking water. It's very hot today, so I want those plants to get in some water ASAP. If possible, it's really, really a good idea to fill your recently made pot with rainwater because tap water often has traces of chemicals in it. Look at that. I'm so pleased with that. One minute it's a pot, the next minute it's a pond. Immersing myself in an activity that has an ulterior motive of helping nature and trying to attract wildlife to my house has actually taken my mind totally off the sort of anxiety that we're all feeling at the moment. And, um, has just been a complete joy. And the best bit is that scientific studies have shown that a healthy pond can attract even more wildlife than any other feature that you can add to your garden. Highly recommend it, actually. If any of you have a bash at making your own ponds in pots or plant pots or washing up bowls, please send in any videos or clips. It would be amazing to see what you have been inspired to create. But for now, we're going to be joining the lovely Lucy for our bird song lesson of the week. Now this week, the bird that we're going to be learning the song of is a really, really familiar garden visitor. I'm sure you all know it. It's probably one of the most iconic birds in Britain, and that is the robin. Now the robin we're going to learn in relation to the bird song that we learned last week, which was the blackbird. And you'll find when you're learning bird song that quite a few bird songs do relate to each other in that way. The way that you get to know them is by having familiarity with another bird. So the robin, when you're listening to it, just compare it to what you know about the blackbird and the blackbird's deep, mournful, tuneful whistle. Now, if we listen to the robin, it's a much higher pitch. Again, it has the same pattern. It sings and then it pauses. It sings and then it pauses. It almost sounds as though it's pausing to think about what it's going to say next, and then it says it. And if you compare it in tone to the blackbird that we learned last week, you'll just notice it's that much higher noise. So if the blackbird was an old man whistling, the robin is a little kid doing an impression of his granddad. If you just listen to that, you'll see the difference. Now, one thing to remember about the robin is that it is one of the first birds to start singing every day and one of the last to stop. It barely stops singing and it can be really influenced by artificial light too. So it can even sing right throughout the night, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning, you might hear the robin singing. So keep an ear out for it. They're very familiar with humans, so they're often quite close. And again, they can be quite loud. So there you go, Robin, Bird Song of the Week. And meet me again next week for another garden bird and learning its song. When you really start to listen, you can start to identify individual sounds and hone in on specific voices. And with this extra time that we are all having on our own patches, I feel like with nature, everything does sound just that little bit louder. My name's Hannah Stipple and I'm a wildlife presenter on BBC Earth. I work on the watches, but I'm also a zoologist and I love all creatures and habitats, great and small. And I'm extremely lucky to live right next to the Gannel Estuary in Newquay, Cornwall. Now, having a site of special scientific interest, just a three minute walk from my front door is something that I don't take for granted, especially now that we can only leave the house once a day. 
And you know, I think in a way that estuarine habitats often get overlooked in spring as they're famous for their dazzling array of overwintering birds. But it is spring here, just as it is in our gardens, woodlands, cities and towns. Now the shifting sand and mud, as well as the change in salinity, makes estuaries incredibly unique habitats and almost places of constant transformation. But what I think is most special about here is the bird life. Just in the last few weeks on my walks, I've seen redshank darting around on the mudflats, oyster catchers, dunlins, and the echoing calls of curlews, which I hear at dawn and dusk from my bedroom window. But do you know what? As someone that goes out actively bird watching and listening to their calls, everything in the last two weeks all of a sudden seems just that little bit louder, more vibrant and more alive. And I think if there's one thing we can take away from this period is that more people are listening. Friends of mine that aren't necessarily interested in wildlife have been cherishing their daily walk. They've been going out listening to and identifying birdsong looking for mini beasts in hedgerows and even putting bird boxes up in their gardens. I wanted to share with you my wild doorstep as we ourselves go through this strange period of transformation. And it doesn't matter where you are, we all have our own wild patch, especially now that we can hear and are listening. We really are all in this together right now and it has been so wonderful to be receiving the pictures and clips from the wildlife that has been visiting your gardens, your balconies, your windows, your rooftops, so please do keep them coming in. There really is so much solace to be found in nature.